some information about um, Quebec's uh, ebook solution called Prep Numerique uh, Bibliopresso, uh, which is a couple page long document with some uh, information about a project they've been working on around ebooks. Super fascinating reading, um, uh, but we won't be covering it off right now because I'm not going to make Tammy read that entire document up to you. Um, so we're going to go to some shorter form talks right now. So I'm going to, got one, two, three, four, uh, five sort of uh, speakers who are going to, um, maybe I'll get you all to move towards the front because half of you are sitting at the very back of the room. Um, we're going to spend about five to eight minutes on a number of topics around just we're calling ebooks in the marketplace. So a bit about uh, ebooks in Canada. Um, 3M, Overdrive, Archambault, and Hoopla. And uh, I will introduce them one at a time as they come up. I think the only person that has slides is our first speaker, and the rest don't have slides. Okay. Awesome. So I'll turn this back on and open up things uh, without messing up this beautiful map. How do you start a slide? The view at the top of that. Wait for this. And our snacks. Okay, so first up is uh, Deb Hutchison Kapp, the Deputy Director of the West Vancouver Memorial Library, with responsibility for technology, communications, and technical services. During her 10 years at uh, WVML, she's been instrumental in developing the first e-reader lending program, which is still going strong, implementing a new model for public technology service, and creating an evidence-based staff technology skills assessment and development program that is now in its fourth year. Oh. Um, she recently <laughs> convened a panel on delivering uh, content on the in the digital market for CLA uh, Forum in Ottawa two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and we'll be sharing her observations from that panel today, as well as some other Okay, how's that? All good? Okay, Ryan, it's gonna be the fun time. Alright, so I'm here to talk about um, e-book trends and usage. I should actually mention that um, my slides may have possibly been prepared by someone standing about five feet to my right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, any questions, I would reserve the right to haul Sarah up here and uh, okay. answer the back. And just, um, actually, it's great that Christina laid out some of, um, obviously, the international context, but also some of what she's seeing um, just happening with pricing internationally. And I'm just going to highlight a few other things that are going on um, out there, and some of which you may be aware of. So, um, some of you might be aware of the fair pricing for ebooks. Uh, campaign that's been going on. This is really being led by Toronto and Ottawa, and if you look at the signatories to this particular initiative, it's largely libraries in Ontario and the Maritimes, uh, but it has been getting a lot of attention um, and having some success. So what they're really trying to do is highlight the price gap between what a uh, consumer is paying for an ebook title and what libraries are having to pay for ebook titles, with the particular aim of encouraging publishers, pressuring publishers, applying social pressure to publishers to offer us more models uh, for purchasing. So not just the one copy, one user, perpetual access, $300 handed over um, sort of use, but to give us this, some additional uh, possibilities. Um, there is some experimentation happening with more of a pay-per-use kind of model. Um, Odillo uh, is doing this ebook, or eBound um, is also reporting that some of their publishers are sort of experimenting with that market. Perhaps dangerous waters, uh, but there are there is some effort in this direction. A snapshot of some provincial statistics. So looking at um, the 2014 data, the 2015 data is not yet with us, but if you look at the year-to-year -year increase of in circulation in libraries uh, of ebooks, we had a 332% increase uh, provincially. So that usage continues to go up. So despite what might be happening in the uh, sales market, the library market is behaving a little bit differently. Um, and actually, um, if any of you follow BookNet, um, their most recent sort of front page story is actually a summary from their recent conference of a panel, or a session rather, about how Canadians use their leisure time. And it's a, it was a study that was done to see, you know, where does reading fall in the ecosystem of how we use our leisure time. And the good news is we're in the top five 
uh, we're kind of solidly at number four, uh, <laughs> which is, I think, roughly where we've been for a while. Um, but what was it, one of the interesting points in there is they kind of went deeper to look at what is what does that reading look like? Who are those readers? And I'm telling you, oh, by the way, 73% of avid readers, women. Most common avid readers, age 35 to 54. So we should not be surprised that the people who darken our doors on a daily basis are largely women age 35 to 54. Also, if we look around this room, <laughs> I'm not saying anything, but anyway. So um, interesting things in, in that way. But also, um, what they're seeing is that um, some of the online sales um, and online kind of book talk is, it seems to be dropping off, um, and bricks and mortar bookstores are seeing more traffic, and library uh, ebooks and e-content are going up. So something is happening, something interesting is happening, not entirely sure what, but something maybe worth looking at. Uh, so if you look at all of our libraries, um, if you sort of take a, a bit of a snapshot of the median, one in two, you could, you could extrapolate from our data that one in two people borrowed an ebook from the library in 2014. And our top five performing libraries in terms of ebook circulation per capita, Squamish, I think I saw some Squamish in the room. Yay, a few Squamish people, yay. Great, I don't know what you're doing, but maybe you should be up here. Um, <laughs> Greater Victoria. <laughs> Anyone from the cast? Lossland. That travel budget perhaps does not accommodate. Uh, Gibsons. All right, so we want to talk to you at the coffee break. So. Um, all right, a uh, few other things. Um, so Sarah does this really awesome little piece of research, and you can talk to her about her methodology. But what she basically does is some different kinds of snapshots about ebook usage by genre. All the three charts, and this is sort of hard to see, but the three on the right um, are library to go titles, what's been viewed, what's been checked out, and what the holds are placed on, and the other two are data from Kobo and Kindle. Um, and it's really just about kind of different ways of looking at usage by genre. And what it, you see is that mystery, thriller, and suspense are driving, it's really no surprise, but are, are really driving that ebook market. So that's the number one most popular thing uh, by and large, although Kindle has a huge romance. And did you put romance? Yes, romance and erotic. I yep. thought it was romance and thrillers. I'm like, really? Sometimes. <laughs> Laurel Hamilton. Okay. Um, What's interesting is if you look at our um, library to go data, so from our uh, provincial consortium, romance is really high on the checkouts there too. Not necessarily on um, holds placed, so <laughs> romance readers will take anything. <laughs> That's my takeaway from that. Um, and also, the little, the little tank line at the end, which is invisible in Kobo, um, and quite low in Kindle, um, very large in, in um, the library to go universe, um, and that's historical fiction. So library users seem to really be really big historical fiction readers, and or we are buying, we are making more historical fiction available. Um, we're using the subject headings that are suggested by the you know, distributors, so you know, we all know that those are not always totally reliable. But some interesting things happening. So again, as Christina was saying earlier, genre is behind the popularity of e-reading for a certain part of um, what's happening with e-reading right now. Few quick other trends. I suspect, no surprise to anyone here, that audiobooks are up and up and up and up. Um, obviously, e-audiobooks, and we're seeing it even with our e uh, audiobooks on CD in the library, that there's increases there. So, um, audiobooks are up. Um, Kobo's reporting that e-books um, make up 18% of Canadian book purchasing. So it gives you a sense of where it is in the market. Christina's going to reference that. BookNet Canada just put out, uh, in April, just put out their state of Canadian publishing uh, in, in April. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting data in there, but lots of kind of good news around our market that most publishers are making their content available to libraries digitally at the same time as their print. So all kinds of good things. Um, and they're reporting a, a modest increase in their ebook sales. Pew did a, a report recently um, that found that only 62% of Americans knew that you could get ebooks at the library. Now, that's kind of sad and it's kind of good because I think that's actually better than you know, my non scientific poll if neighbors had parents backyard barbecue a year ago. So, um, so maybe, maybe we're doing okay. Is that about equal to the number of people that actually have devices that can use their books? I might even be equal to the number of people who know the library still exists, right? So, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, actually, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the data is on um, the penetration of yeah, devices that you could actually read it. But yeah, that would actually be a change. Smartphones. 
Smartphones are higher than that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, and the last thing is the state of e books in Canada. Which is, so this was, um, as, as uh, Sarah mentioned, I had the opportunity to pull together a panel on um, basically on making con digital content available in a digital market. Um, and we had panelists, Christina actually, uh, from the Library Universe, um, as well as panelists from publishing and from the ebook distribution market, just to talk about uh, what was going on with, uh, with ebooks in Canada and to be part of a kind of a policy and advocacy conversation with the people who were attending the Canadian Library Association Forum. Uh, what was interesting was with those sort of three sort of perspectives is that everyone's dealing with the same issues. So whether you're talking to a publisher or a library or Overdrive or another distributor, everyone's dealing with pricing. What is the right way to price ebook content um, and budget for it and everything else? And also about navigating different distribution models. So we're looking at the same problems from different points of view, but everyone's still struggling with these questions and no one's found the magic bullet. And the more we can share um, our data and our information, um, the better we will do together. Um, it's also interesting to me to hear that DRM is sort of universally problematic. Again, it's not just libraries that complain about DRM. Um, it's a problem for publishers, it's a problem for distributors. And it's actually something that I think we're tr they're trying to move away from. So there might be some hope on the horizon there. Um, I won't summarize all of my notes. Um, well, one thing that was interesting was that in that room, um, I was fully expecting it to be half full of public libraries, but it was actually half full of academic libraries. And then about a quarter full of government librarians, and then just a smattering of everybody else. So um, my takeaway from that was that, well, the academic library universe is interesting um, in a couple of ways. They have other models for ebook acquisition than we have in public libraries, and some of them are quite interesting. Some of them are very problematic for academic libraries. So there's a lot of bundling that goes on. So if you want this one title, you have to buy 100 things that no one will ever borrow. Um, there's also issues around, like it might be available today, but when you want to buy a few more copies, well, too bad you can't have them anymore. There's, there's, they're, they're dealing with their own sets of issues. But what came through to me was that public libraries, um, I think especially through the work that Pelk has done and then Readers First, um, we've been talking to publishers and we've been talking to distributors, and I think those conversations have gotten public libraries to a pretty good place. And I mean, this is happening all around North America, but I think it's been a huge part of the fact that we're having much different conversation now than we were having five years ago about ebooks and libraries, is that we've had conversations and we've been able to actually find common ground and work together towards solutions. Um, and actually, as libraries articulate a positive vision for what we would like ebooks to look like and share that and then give them something to work towards. I think the last thing I'll say is, um, from the CLA point of view, is um, the ebook advocacy piece of CLA work has now been formally handed over to CULC. So CULC will be taking the lead in that area, and I think CULC is probably working on how that works and how that looks, um, considering that, of course, CULC only has membership from public libraries with a population of 100,000 or more. So, you know, how do they do that ebook advocacy and sort of include the um, I think that's what it's underway. There you go. Thank you. Thank you.